Okay everybody, this is Moody Dashcam. Today we are in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, which I feel like I'm in every other video. So much mob activity over here. But today we're gonna to be talking about the killing of a DEA agent by Costabile Ferracci Jr. The most Italian name you've ever heard, also known as Gus Ferracci. All right, so we're gonna be heading to where Gus Ferracci was eventually caught but I'll give you this whole rundown on the way there, of course, as always. Right now we are on Benson Ave. We'll be turning, making a right up the Bay Parkway in a block or two. The next block up here. All right, so his dad and uncle were involved in a Colombo family gambling ring. So his family was uh, peripherally around the mafia. Uh, he was this tough kid that was always getting into trouble when he was young and then October 7th 1979 Gus and his friends were in Greenwich Village Manhattan when a 17 and 16 year old male prostitute Seems weird that they were that young, but uh, they approached them and his group of friends Which led to him and his group of friends grabbing them throwing them in the car bringing them to Wolf's Pond Park in Staten Island where he actually used to play peewee football they then beat them with driftwood. The 17-year-old, they beat the 17-year-old to death. The 16-year-old narrowly escaped death by swimming into the pond, and they didn't feel like going into the pond to get him. I also heard they forced them to do sex acts on them. He was a really sick guy. He was known to rape women all the time, uh, and teenage boys and teenage girls raped them also. Pretty insane uh, person if you ask me. Not someone you want to surround yourself with or be around at all, really. I'll put a picture of what he looked like when he was a little bit older. Uh, the guy was giant. He was 6'3", 220 pounds. Which the pictures look like he's probably weighed more than 220 pounds. If he was that tall. But yeah, definitely a medicine guy. Known to like, uh, apparently, he killed somebody in one punch with brass knuckles. That seems like one of those urban legends, but... Okay, so after that, he gets eight years. He spends eight years in prison, prison for manslaughter. Uh, while he was in prison, he just happened to protect a guy named Petrucielli from getting killed with a barbell in the weight room. So he protects this guy, and then a mobster named Jerry Chili sees that and kind of like takes him under his wing. After that, so he's kind of protected in prison by Jerry Chili, which is Gerard Chili, nicknamed Jerry. Then he gets out of prison, starts dealing drugs with some of his connections that he had from before prison and during prison. Ends up hooking up with Gregory Scarpa Jr., which I did a, a story on Gregory Scarpa, so we'll go back and check that out. Hooks up with Jeremy, uh, Gregory Scarpa Jr. Uh, and the Wimpy Boys Social Club, which I also visited. So then he starts dealing drugs. He becomes kind of a, I wouldn't say a big time drug dealer, but he was dealing drugs. He was dealing weed, cocaine, and probably anything else he could get his hands on. Which eventually leads to uh, DEA agent Everett Hatcher, who bought cocaine off him a few times. Now this time was different because it was an informal meeting. There wasn't any drugs or money being transferred. So Everett Hatcher, and his team decide, all right, you don't need a gun. So he goes there, he's wearing a wire, he's got a team close by listening in to everything that's going on. Of course, that connection with the wire goes bad and they don't hear everything that's happening. The team sees uh, Gus's van and Hatcher's Buick leave. They lose them in traffic. So after like frantically searching for about an hour, they find they go back to the original meeting place where they find Everett Hatcher, DEA agent, killed in his car. Shot four times in the uh, head, shoulders, and neck. Which was, at the time, the first uh, federal agent killed since 1972, which is crazy. And they think the first law enforcement agent killed on Staten Island. 
which also seems crazy since Staten Island was such a mob, mobbed up area. All right, we just turned on to 82nd Street. So yeah, this sparked off a nationwide manhunt for Gus Faraci. I mean, it was crazy. It was a, the biggest reward at the time for federal, biggest federal reward at the time ever put out, $250,000. It actually got the uh, attention of President Bush at the time. Um, and he, he landed himself on the FBI's most wanted list. So while all this is going on, you would think he would leave the New York area, which he didn't. He ends up hanging out at uh, Margaret Babe Scarpa's house, her nickname was Babe, which was actually Jerry Chili's daughter and Gus Faraci's ex-girlfriend from like back in the day. As he's staying at her house, he's sleeping with her, which pisses off Jerry Chili, which makes Jerry Chili want to kill Gus Faraci. So Jerry Chili goes to Petrucielli, who Gus saved in prison, who is helping Gus find different spots to hide out from the FBI. Petrucielli decides to not give Jerry Chili any information. So a month later, he's found dead with a, like a pillowcase or something over his head which indicates to not lie or not keep secrets from the Mafia. A lot of crazy um, backstory on all these guys. So, ridiculous manhunt goes on. FBI most wanted list. Their most useful tactic for trying to find him, they couldn't find him anywhere. I, I believe it was eight months where they, it was totally, they couldn't find anything. Tips coming in, all that kind of stuff. There were... There was a team of men working full-time, seven days a week, dedicated to it. I heard one report that it was 40 people. I heard another report that it was 400. So, somewhere between there. Their most useful tactic was putting pressure on the mob. Anywhere there was any mobster, there was an officer in plain sight right around them. They were knocking on all big mobsters' doors, trying to get any information they could to find this guy. Agent Stutman, who was... Uh, close with Everett Hatcher when he was alive, kind of made it his mission to find this guy. So he goes and knocks on Sammy the Bull's door and kind of implies like, hey, uh, you notice how there's a lot of pressure on you guys? If you find Gus, the pressure will kind of be relieved. And Sammy the Bull actually has a video on this. He was like, so you're asking me to kill Gus right now? He said, no, no, we didn't say that. And then he asked, uh, they asked him to go to John Gotti. He said, go to John Gotti yourself. So they do the same thing with John Gotti and they tell John Gotti in, in as few words as they can to do the right thing. If his people do the right thing, the pressure will be off his guys. So then a month later at 11 p.m. in front of 1814 81st Street in Bensonhurst, officers found Gus almost dead in the passenger seat of a gray Pontiac with gunshot wounds to the head, neck, back, and leg. Uh, he didn't even have, he had a gun in his waistband. He didn't even have time to reach for his gun. And in the car with him was Joseph Scalafani. He was the driver. He fired twice at the van that pulled up next to them. Now, pretty ironic that he died in almost the same way that he killed that FBI agent. Van pulls up next side of them, shots fired. I believe it was 16 shots at their uh, gray Pontiac parked. Uh, the passenger was found, uh, well, the driver, uh, Gus was the passenger. He was found shot in the chest, back, and arm. He was on the sidewalk when they found him. Uh, it wasn't until eight years later when they were found, the, the, the shooters were found. Louis Tuzio, James Gallioni, and Mario Gallo. Now right here should be where, let's see. I'm pretty much parked exactly where this, uh, 
all took place. So right here, van pulls up at 11 p.m., bunch of shots fired, two dead guys. I mean, now Gus wasn't dead when the cops pulled up, but he was dead when he ended up in the hospital. So, oh, I also forgot to mention, the cops went after everybody that Gus knew to try and find him. I mean, arrested everyone. They arrested uh, Margaret Scarpa and raided the house and brought her out, arrested her this whole thing for um, aiding and abetting a fugitive or whatever. So yeah, that is pretty much everything I have to tell you about Gus Faraci. He's part of the Bonanno crime family. He lived till he was 29 years old. One sick, sick dude. All right, I'll see you in the next one. Forgot to mention this, but he also did not even know that Everett Hatcher was an agent. He thought he was a regular drug dealer that turned and ratted. Because when they found him shot dead, his wire was not um, messed with at all. And the person that was in the van with Gus Faraci while he did the shooting later on came out and said that they both did not know that he was a DEA agent. I'm sure if they did know that he was a DEA agent, they wouldn't have killed him because that brings a ridiculous amount of heat to them and their crew. Alright, just wanted to add that in.